Brown is no good. Rebounded by Anthony. Two seconds left. Anthony for the win. Got it. All right, all right, all right. Welcome back to another episode of the Close Up Magic. I'm your host, Stephen Cameron, and today we have a really, really fun episode. Uh, shortly, we are going to be joined by Malik Grady and Dante Marcatelli, Orlando Magic broadcaster, and we have a really good interview with Dante. Um, he gave us, a, he was very generous with his time with us. Um, we got into a little bit how he got into journalism and broadcast, uh, you know, his journey with, with the Magic. Um, a little bit more like back end stuff uh, that that not everyone would think about um, with just you know what we see on TV, and um, then we get into some thoughts about the Magic and the current squad, and it's just a really good episode. Dante is such a cool guy; he's, he's really nice and genuine, and and um, you know I know he works for the Magic, but he clearly is a Magic fan as well, and and we get into a little bit of the fandom aspect of of his role there, um, which you'll hear shortly. Before we get into the interview with Dante and and as well, like I said, Malik will be joining there. Um, we're just going to hit a couple notes real fast, uh, do our housekeeping, um, talk a little bit about what we've seen recently with the team, and uh, then we'll get right into it. So uh, before we get into that, we'll just get into the housekeeping, like I said, um, plug, get your close-up magic merch, links in the description here. Um 19 Media Group is the network that we are part of. They help us do things like get merch. Um, some of the new sponsorships that you're hearing is all because of them. They have a great uh, plethora of, of other types of shows on their network, lifestyle, um, sports, politics, all sorts of stuff. So go check out 19mediagroup.com. Um, there's a lot of really good content that they're doing. Um and for us, if you could like and subscribe to this show, that would be great. Particularly if you're on YouTube, hit that subscribe button. We'd love for those subscriber numbers to keep going up. Last but not least, we st you still have a few more days to enter in the giveaway. Um, we are giving away an Orlando Magic t-shirt. You're seeing it right here on the screen right now. You'll be able to pick your color and your size. Um, all you have to do is sign up for the Patreon program. We have two different tiers, $5 tier and a $10 tier. They get you some different level of access. Um, some extra content, some more integration to a community that we're trying to build. Um, so it's, it's a really good thing that we're trying, that we're building. We're, we're analyzing the Patreon program. We're seeing if the tiers still make sense. If you see something on there that you think should be adjusted, that would make you more willing to want to support and jump on the Patreon program, go ahead and let us know. But, um, Go ahead and, uh, you know, if you're interested, check it out. The link is in the description of the shows. It's also posted on our Twitter account um, and on the link trees that, that you can see on all of our social pages. So uh, we appreciate the consideration there. Cool. All right. So this is two episodes for the week. We did one earlier on Monday with Patrick where we talked about the Pacers and 76 and the Nets games. Um, but since then, we just played the Atlanta Hawks at home. Um and it was not really a great game, to be quite honest. The Magic had some major rebounding issues. They had some uh, lack of effort and energy on defense. It just did not didn't seem like things were connecting well. You can tell they're really missing Wendell Carter. Um, uh, you know, Bull Bull was really struggling boxing out. Paulo Bencaro didn't. I think he, I don't remember the box score off the top of my head, but it was a very few rebounds. Uh, that's not ideal for your starting power forward and center to, to be doing. I think they combined for about seven or eight rebounds total for the entire game. Um, bull bull had six. I, I, I'm, I apologize. I don't have Paul is off the top of my head. Um, but it, it wasn't great. It wasn't great. It was nice, though. We did to get Markel Fultz back. It was his home opener um, in his first game back for the season. Cole Anthony was back. Terrence Ross came back. Um, that was really fun to to see them get integrated. You can tell that um, you can tell that it's just going to open up things. Uh, we we talked about it a little bit with Dante, but one of the very first plays that you see with Fultz on is is. Is, is getting a ball, getting a pass to Franz cutting to the basket. Um, you know, 
Franz is amazing on ball. He's, I mean, he's becoming really good, but he's so good off ball. He's just such a smart cutter. He knows where to move. He knows how to navigate around defenders. Um, and, and having Fultz to deliver him passes to, you know, to, to potentially make a shot or make another secondary pass is going to be just a really nice thing for this, for this team. Um, Cole Anthony is a scoring punch. Uh, another guy who can operate the D, the, the offense a little bit. Um, it's not quite the same floor general as Markel Fultz is, but, you know, he's still, someone that we were missing on this team. Um, we did lose uh, uh, Gary Harris. He went out with a a quad injury. Um, we didn't get any updates from the Magic this morning or today at all. I'm recording this at uh, this evening on the 1st. Um, we, we didn't get any updates. That kind of gives me the feeling that maybe it's not super serious and he'll, maybe he'll just miss a couple of games that's recovering, but... That's pure speculation on my part. I really don't know. I'm just trying to be optimistic here. Um, he was starting to really come into form. I was really starting to appreciate the the defense that Gary was giving us and and being able to knock down corner three shots. So it's a bummer to see him go, but at least we got a couple more guys back. It, it really almost does feel like every time we get someone back, we lose someone right now, and the cycle is just continuing to happen. And it's, it's really frustrating. Um, but, you know, we also got some news this morning from um, – Kobe Price, that Wendell Carter Jr. is going to be out for another one to two weeks, most likely. So the next nine games are really, really tough, too. We're playing the Bucks, playing the Celtics. Uh, we play the Clippers. It's just not an easy run. And we play we play the Raptors. We play a lot of these teams twice, too. Um, so it's going to be really tough. So the sooner Wendell Carter Jr. can come back, the better to help us with our defense and our rebounding. Um Mo Bamba sounds like he might be back relatively soon. Next couple of games. Um, I believe he's, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if he misses another game or two, but it'd be, it could be, he could be back on our next game. I'm not sure. Um, but he, he should be back. We'll see. So <sighs> the magic are on a six game losing streak. Um, it's, it's not, it's not fun right now. We definitely need, um, we definitely need a win soon. I'm pulling up the magic schedule because I don't have it memorized and I apologize. Um, I don't have this stuff right off the top of my head. Uh, but yeah. Okay. So we play the, we play the Cavaliers tomorrow. Uh, probably most today when you guys are all listening to this, we play the Cavaliers. Um, and then it's the next couple of games on, on, uh, on Monday, we have a little bit of a, on Saturday, we play the Raptors. On Monday, we play the Bucks. Wednesday, the Clippers. And then Friday and Sunday, uh, both games against the Raptors again. That's like the next weekish of games. That's tough. It's going to be really hard. So, um, and, you know, when you're going up against the Bucks and the Clippers, they have some really big wings. Um, the Raptors, too. These are just like really big teams that. Um, it'd be nice to get some size back with Wendell Carter. Um, he's just a little bit more of a physical player than what we have right now with Bull Bull at center. Um, so we'll see. All right. Before we get into the the interview with Dante Marcatelli, we're going to pay some bills and listen to a couple of ads. One of them I'm going to read. The support for the close-up magic is brought to you by Manscaped, who is the best in men's below-the-waist grooming. Manscaped offers precise engineering tools for your family jewels. Manscaped relaunched or recently launched the ultimate men's hygiene bundle, the performance package. Join over 70 million men worldwide who trust Manscaped with this exclusive offer. 20% off and free worldwide shipping with promo code CLOSEUP at manscaped.com. Um, I've had the Manscaped products for a couple of weeks now. They're really good been using them for a while um it's 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 good they sponsor they sponsor podcasts and they 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 for a reason because they want their product out there and people that are using their product are really enjoying it myself included um the performance package 4.0 by manscape um has arrived and it's it's definitely a game changer inside the package you're going to find the lawnmower 4.0 trimmer the weed whacker ear and nose trimmer um the crop preserver ball deodorant <laughs> makes me laugh every time. Sorry. Uh, the crop reviver toner. Uh, they throw in some boxers and a t-shirt and it's, it's a pretty good performance package. Um, and again, you'll get 20% off with promo code close up magic. Um, 
The fourth generational trimmer features a cutting edge ceramic blade to reduce grooming accidents. Thanks to their advanced safe skin technology, the lawnmower 4.0 is waterproof for all of you people that like to clean your manhood area or, or womanhood. If, if you're a woman that wants to buy this stuff, um, you can clean it in the shower. You can do all your trimming in the shower if you'd prefer. So um, they're water, they're waterproof and also has a 4,000 LED spotlight for you to just get that precise look and feel when you're when you're doing your thing. Um, just in time for the holidays. I know some of y'all are going to be trying to cozy up with, with some significant others, potentially. Make sure you feel clean down there. Um, get 20% off free shipping with the code CloseUpMagic at Manscaped.com. That's 20% off with free shipping at Manscaped.com. Use promo code CloseUpMagic. Unlock your confidence and always use the right tools for the job with Manscaped. All right, everyone. As we said in the intro, we got Dante Marcatelli with us today. Dante, how's it going? Thank you so much for joining the show. Hey, man. It's good to be with you guys. I appreciate you thinking of me, and uh, I hope all is going well with you guys here one quarter of the way through the season. So here we go. Yes, sir. It's uh, things are going well. Um, you know, we're recording this on December 1st after the magic uh, fell to the Atlanta Hawks last night. But we'll get to that in a little bit. Um, Dante, we're going to break this up into kind of two segments. First, learn a little bit more about you, broadcasting, journalism, all that stuff. And then if we have time, we'll talk a little bit more about the current everyday magic that we see on a regular basis. Um, but first, I'd like to know, and I think Malik would too, how was how did you get connected and what was your journey like with the Orlando Magic? Just that kind of that little story on on just your journey from broadcast to now doing what you're doing with the Magic. Yeah, well, I think it's uh, it's interesting. First of all, I appreciate it. I, I appreciate the opportunity to chat with you guys and, and kind of tell that story a little bit. But uh, I grew up in Boston, Massachusetts, so I was a big sports fan. And anyone that's familiar with that area, like sports talk radio reigns supreme. It did. Like you can't wait to get in the car and hash out how the Red Sox did or the Bruins did or, you know, why would Tom Brady leave us or, you know, whatever the topic is, right? So you, you hash it out and you live for all these takes and all these fans and you suffer uh, with all these other fans that are going through the same thing. So that's how I grew up. And, you know, back then, you know, the the, the Celtics, the Re I mean, the Red Sox and the Patriots, they didn't have the run that they had here in the 2000s. So it was a lot of suffering. It was a lot of bad, you know, bad losses and, and just heartbreaking losses. So I, I grew up and we all kind of came together as a community through that. You know, and it kind of was therapeutic to hear that. And I thought, man, wouldn't that be fun? to just be able to be involved in that in some capacity. And then I moved to upstate New York um, to go through high school, and I wasn't around any of that. And I, I kind of had that taken away from. So not only can I not watch and listen to all my favorite teams, but now it's the direct rivals. It's the Yankees. It's the Giants. It's the Knicks. I mean, it's all the hated teams that I had, you know, growing up. So, But I'd put on the radio, guys, and I would – listen to a game and I could find a, a game in Yankee stadium or Fenway park, or it'd be a national broadcast and it'd be in LA. And it took me to another place. And for two hours, two and a half hours, I was distracted. I was taken, I was entertained and I was transplanted to another place. And I was all in on whatever team I was listening to. And I just became enamored with that. And I thought if I could, if I could ever provide that opportunity uh, at some point in my life or in my career, I'm going to do it. I, I just would. I just would absolutely be blessed if I could be around sports in any capacity. Um, I was. I, I was fortunate enough to know very early that I wasn't going to be an NBA player. Uh, I was about sixth or seventh grade. I, I knew it wasn't going to be in the cards for me. Uh, so I had. So this was my chance to be around it. So I got a broadcasting degree. I got, I got a mass communications degree from Liberty University. And when I graduated from Liberty, I took a radio production internship with the Orlando Magic. And it was behind the scenes and working in radio production and eventually hoping, could I possibly be one day lucky enough to have my own radio show? That was it. That was the goal. Could I do a daily radio show? I think I, that would be awesome. I'll start behind the scenes. Um, and so that that was kind of my uh, – that's all I ever wanted to do. 
Um, and then we had the we had the Orlando Miracle. For those that go you know go way back here to Central Florida, we had a WNBA team. And when the Magic season was over, that's a lot of work for then someone to then have to do the Miracle game. So I got hired as the producer on radio for four years to do the Miracle, and that's kind of how I got on full time with the Magic. So uh, I, I was lucky enough to do that, and so I, I'm always grateful to the WNBA and the Miracle uh, for kind of giving me my chance to get on. And then. About 10 years after that, it, you know, I, I started doing more on air, and then I got to go on to the television side, uh, which was awesome, making that switch and, and never look back. I just love doing TV and, and being involved in the Orlando Magic broadcast and being a part of this community. It's something I never thought I would do, uh, and hopefully when people watch and listen to what we do every day, they're like, man, this guy, this guy looks like he can't believe he's doing what he gets to do, and that, that's how I want it to come across. Real quick, how, how long did you um... – Sorry, Malik. Uh, just I'll, this is a quick answer, I think. How long have you been on the broadcast side of it now, like in, in front of the camera? Well, I started sparingly in like 04, 05. I started right after Tracy McGrady left. I did like a handful of games. And then more regularly about 2008, 2009 when we were making our finals run. And then full time when we got to the new arena in 2010. I, I, I became every, every pre-game and pre, pre-half and post-game show. Well, I'm trying to understand the timing. I was looking online trying to get a, a gauge of your career, that kind of thing. There was one estimation that made it seem like maybe you were mid, late 50s to 60s. Is that That's older than you are. Or am I getting that wrong? Or where do you at? Because timing-wise, if you went to college in 94 to 98, is that when you graduated high school? Was there a time in between there where you were just working? Yeah. Or what? No, I graduated. No, I graduated. I, went, I came down here right after. So in my 40, mid-40s now. So I've been... Uh, so I graduated. I graduated high school and went right to college. Right. So you're right. The timeline's right. Ninety four to ninety eight, and then ninety eight. So that ninety eight ninety nine season was when I started. That was my intern year with the Orlando Magic. Okay. That was my first year, and it was a lockout. Nice. So here I am. That's I, what you I was going to say. Yeah, the lockout year. Jason Williams. It was a lockout year, yeah. and. And we, so we weren't playing. So I was fortunate enough to still get the internship, but we still had hockey games. We had solar bear games and we knew the miracle we we're going to play. Um, so I knew I would at least be doing those, but guys, I'm telling you as a guy, as a kid, that was a huge NBA fan, college basketball fan. I loved UNC, absolutely loved UNC and would watch all those Tar Heel games. Uh, now I'm here. I'm in a gym at the RDB sports bikes. We don't have games. So Vince Carter, Jason Williams, the white chocolate, Jason Williams, um, Bo Outlaw, Nick Anderson are playing pickup basketball games and with all of us. And th- this is my introduction to the I mean, it was unbelievable, absolutely out of this world. So everybody that lived in Central Florida, this is how they would come get some run because uh, guys weren't allowed to, to use the NBA facilities because it was a lockout. It was awesome. Uh, so that was my kind of my introduction. And I did not hold my own. So in case you're wondering. Uh, I love Jason Williams so much. I remember that year when he was going through the draft process and people thought he was going to be maybe a late first round pick or not at all. As a Florida fan, we were like, this kid is legit. He's going top 10 and going to be amazing. I was glad he finally got to the Magic eventually, but I wish he had had that number 55 jersey. So it was kind of iconic for him and all. So interesting to hear that from you. Yeah, man. So you so you knew that about Jay Will because I I know I didn't know much about him. I have to say I knew a little bit about uh, you know he kind of went to a couple of different schools and I I knew he was you know a bit of a wild card could turn the ball over this and that whatever. But I, I that that's kind of how it was portrayed to me. I laid eyes on this guy and I said this guy is an absolute star. I mean what granted he's doing it to us right in this and the, but he's doing all the behind the back stuff and he's doing all these crazy passes i mean he was was he not as entertaining as anybody that there has ever played this game with his hands on the basketball well it, and after that lockout that was his rookie year he's one of the main guys that made you know the whole league pass rankings a thing Good because point. You wanted to Good see point. what he was going to do behind the back stuff, and Chris Weber, who was energized, and Peja Stojakovic. You know, it was just unbelievable. And have a Florida a guy doing that that we always wanted back in here. And again, Vince Carter from yeah. Daytona Beach. We wanted him with the Magic for so long. We only had him for sure. a short time. So I'm so envious that you got to share those times with him as a a true Orlando Magic guy. <laughs> Yeah, it was fun. And they were great guys to be t- – Vince Carter, all-time favorite. I mean, I don't think there's a nicer human being on this earth. And then to get to work with him for a year and a half was was astounding. But that's that's the t- long way to answer your question, Stephen. As someone who just didn't really – could never imagine working in the NBA and doing it for this long to be – now I did a broadcast with Vince Carter the other night. Quentin Richardson is our analyst. Nick Anderson, right? Bo Outlaw. 
Jeff Turner, who played the game, Brian Hill, who coached and took a team to an NBA Finals. I mean, this is it's a kid in a candy store. This isn't supposed to happen, man. This is a, a living a dream. So that, that that's what makes this, regardless of the team being five and seventeen. That's what excites me. That's what excites me every day is getting to work with these guys. You know, you get to watch promising young talent, but you're getting to work with guys that I, I grew up with. Totally. It's a lot of fun. I, I, I want to get back in a second to a couple more specific broadcast questions, but I do, I mean, this is a central part of, part of it too. You grew up in Boston. I imagine you, you I mean, you were a Celtics fan. Sure. Um, when you came down here, did you all of a sudden like stop following the Celtics and we're just all in on the magic. Was there a transition period? Do you still enjoy the Celtics? I know you're a big new England um, Patriots fan sure. still. Um, but like, it's also no secret that you're in love with the Orlando magic too. Um, and that's not just because you work for them in my opinion. I mean, maybe that had a small right. thing to do with leading up to your passion for them now, but how did kind of your sports alignment um start with with the magic with your transition from moving from the northeast to to to, to central florida yeah, it's a great question i you know I, larry bird was everything for me right i absolutely and i would just battle my friends all day people still do this right they debate who's the greatest and who's their favorite and who's better than who and i would bring on all takers right larry bird against michael jordan magic johnson right everybody there uh you you name it and that's what i live for i just i love Larry Bird, to me, made everybody better. Yeah, he could go out and score 50, but the way he saw the game, the way he passed, that's what I appreciated the most about him. And then you find out he's this unbelievable trash talker, which I love. So we have we have the Atlanta Hawks in last night, and I'm, I'm standing there talking to Dominique Wilkins, who's telling Larry Bird stories. Like, that's unbelievable to me. It's just it's, it's absolutely crazy and surreal. And, it is, and when it stops being surreal is when I'll stop doing it because I, I, I just don't see that happening. But – when I first came down here, so that 98-99 season, it was the ML Carr years. And for those diehard NBA fans, or you'll remember, ML Carr was hired for the team to tank for a couple of years, hoping to get Tim Duncan. And Tim Duncan didn't get it. I think the Celtics ended up getting like the third and fifth pick or the fourth and sixth. They ended up with Chauncey Billups, who was great. Not the Chauncey Billups that we all know now. Um, Ron, Ron Mercer. Mercer. Yeah. Exactly. Those were the picks. That was their reward for two years of awful basketball. They didn't get Tim Duncan, right? So uh, to answer your question, it made it very, as an employee, first of all, now I'm an employee of the Orlando Magic, right? So I'm going to, that's who signs my checks. So when the Celtics play the Magic, I'm going to cheer for the for the Orlando Magic. But they were so bad, it made it really easy. <laughs> it made it really easy to make that transition. That makes sense. Uh, and we're, and I'm, we're working with Penny Hardaway, Nick Anderson, Horace Grant, right? Uh, so that was it was Chuck Daly, right? Who was a yeah. who was a coaching legend. That that's the team that Antoine uh, Walker, here, my, Jesus, yeah, was here my first year, and so it made that it made that transition pretty easy. Then you know then now yeah, I eventually introduced Paul Pierce into the mix uh, and all that, and things changed. But when the Celt when, when the Magic season is over, and if, especially if they get eliminated from the playoffs, I do cheer for the Celtics. I, I think Makes it's sense. you know you it's hard to not, but but I would. You know that 09 finals run. I, I was real. I really thought, man, this is really going to put me to the test because I'm in Boston, you know. And I was annoyed by the fans. And I'm like, I was one of those fans, like cheering so hard for the Celtics, you know. And, and I was annoyed by them, and I was annoyed by the by the Celtic players. And I was, I was, I was all in on. I had no hesitation, 100 percent sure. Magic fan through and through. So that that's where my allegiance has been since I got here, and, and still is today. And and that makes a lot of sense. I uh, I've obviously lived in Orlando, grew up in Orlando, magic through and through. But the last eight years I've been in the Bay next to an incredible Golden State Warriors team. It's hard right. for me not to enjoy them and root for them when the magic are eliminated after the regular season. Um, unfortunately, most of the years I've been out here except for two. Um, yeah, but at least yeah. it's like, oh, cool. I have I have another team that I enjoy and, and can root oh, yeah. for. So I, I very much – I very much um, – understand the sense of well, and, and I'm a big believer there. you should support the team of where you live too right yeah. so if you yeah. if you live in an area you should support that team because it's great that nothing brings a community together like sports right you can so enjoy you more than it. one team you can enjoy more well, than one team you can more and then when we uh, get back to the finals you can you can abandon the warriors there's nothing exactly, wrong exactly <laughs> exactly exactly now the, the big question I have Dante is when did you become Dante Marcatelli the, the kind of polished gentleman that we see the graying temples, the tailored suits, the pocket square, <laughs> the, the sneakers, um, kind of rivaling Brian Hill as, as in terms of style, that kind of thing. 
um, because I was joking with Stephen that <laughs> we had found a picture of you playing t-ball at eight years old with you know graying temples, looking distinguished. <laughs> like, when did this persona? Was that persona around during the ten years when you were invisible, or was it like ten years in? You're like, oh, wait a minute, I got to get my stuff together, the haircut. The, the suit now I, I got it got it all going or was it like you know you first started coming in and you were just wearing you know crew t-shirts or what have you like when did, yeah, when did Dante yeah, yeah. Marcatelli become Dante Marcatelli oh that is awesome well first of all that you're way too kind thank you very much I I really appreciate that because I don't look at it that way uh certainly at all I, I just think at some point you got to make a decision if this is what you want to do you got to go all in so I, I ever since I had an opportunity to go on air and be part of the telecast. I'm, I'm going to do it to the best that I can and, and try to be, yeah, but you got to be true to yourself, right? If this, you can have whatever look you want. If it's not you, it's hard to pull it off. So I, I try to do, you know, I try to be genuine, certainly genuine to me, but I, I think, you know, it's interesting. It's, it's kind of a tale of two careers because this, for me, the whole thing kind of started with, with Dante and Galante. We would do summer league broadcasts and that was more off the cuff. That, that wasn't, there was nothing polished about that. That was all like, just messing around. That was basically making fun of everybody that was in the summer league games for hours on end. And that, that's what we did. And that's And it was funny and it was all tongue in cheek. And obviously we appreciate everybody that played in those games, but it was kind of more on that side is kind of how I come up. And now it's like, okay, we're going to talk about a team. We're going to analyze things and we quickly have to change. We have to be as professional as possible. I, I can't help when the, when the graying temples comes in, man, that, that's just, as you get older, you know, that's just something that I can't, you know, you can't hide that. I guess I could try to hide it, but why not? I just fully embrace it. And I just tried to, it's, it's, for me, it's, it's hard guys. I, I have to make a conscious decision. You know, when I moved down from Boston, I had a thick Boston accent. And as an intern, I did a radio spot and I was all excited because my voice was going to be on an NBA broadcast and my commercial ran that night that I voiced 30 second commercial. I talked to my boss the next day and I said, Awesome. I said, what's the feedback? I said, everybody must have been so excited, right, to hear this. And you know what they said? That the, the, the general manager at the time running the radio station said, that guy is to never be on our air ever again. That was the Whoa. feedback that I got. So here, I, I mean, dreams completely crashed and shattered. And so really, I, I think from that moment on, it, my entire driving force has been to prove that guy wrong. In all that's, honesty, and and I've used him as motivation ever since. So every time I get an opportunity, amazing. if it's polished or distinct, whatever it may be, it's all to try to prove him wrong. That that's that's Look, still the driving transformation from that time. That's amazing. <laughs> that's, right. that's amazing. Wow. That's right. That's right. Dante, Man. you've teed me up perfect for my next and and potentially last uh, questions for this segment before we transition to the team. Unless Malik has another one. Um, this is kind of a two parter, right? I grew up okay. in broadcast. I worked on the camera side. Um, for, for many years before I transitioned to marketing where I'm at now, different industry, um, still, still in content creation. But so my two part question is this, what is one of the more challenging aspects of your job that people might not know or understand completely? Cause it's more than just talking to players in front of the camera. Um, yeah. and then my follow up to that is we have a lot of listeners for this show right? We have a decent amount. And I'm sure some of them are younger, earlier trying to develop and explore what their careers might look like and might even be interested in what you're doing. What is one piece of advice for someone who might want to transition or work towards going to sports broadcasting? Well, I think those are, well, those are great questions, Stephen. I, I think everybody's going to, I think if you talk to a hundred people, you, you might get a hundred different answers, you know, as, as far as that goes. But I, I think to the, the last part first is, you know, you have to be authentic. I, I think it, you have to be authentic. If you're, if you're wanting to be a broadcaster and someone's watching or listening and they, they want to be a stats person, they want to be data driven, they want to be all about analytics. Well, if that's not you, it's not going to work. Right. And if you want to be a hot take person, but you struggle to come up with hot takes or your takes aren't good, or you can't argue them, then you can't go that route. Like you have to be authentic whatever your passion is whatever drives you uh is is what you is what you have to be about that that then nobody's going to take that from you nobody can tell you no uh you and you're always going to believe in that because that's who you are and I, I think that's i think i think that's so i think that's so important and what i tell everybody too guys is you know you have to find out what separates you we we, we interview a bunch of people we have graduate assistants now we used to call them interns and there's people that apply for jobs to be on the broadcast and the one thing everybody what separates you and they say well 
my passion, my work ethic, right? Nobody's going to work harder than me. Nobody loves basketball more than me. Nobody has, nobody's more, pa- well, you know, they don't know it, but we've talked to a hundred people. They've all said the same thing. Everybody's passionate. Everybody loves sports. Everybody loves basketball, which is great. You have to, to get into this. What's, what makes you, Stephen Cameron, different than Malik? What makes you, Malik, different than the Six Man podcast? Or what makes this podcast, what is your thing? And I think once you find that out, then I think that that's when you can really take off. And I think then you start catering all of your segments, all of your broadcasts into that. You know, your podcast can be about that. You know, it can be whatever it is. And so I, I think that I, I challenge everybody to find that. What are you passionate about? And, and you know, what separates you as you're trying to find a job? What is the one thing you can sit down in a job interview that you can tell, I do this better than anybody? That that's that's so that's something that I challenge everybody to find out. The challenging thing about this job, guys, is you know when you're five and seventeen, you know, and I know we're going to talk about the team here as well. But you know, you mentioned the Warriors, like I, you know, you that's not hard work to sit down and do a Warriors broadcast, like that's or to do the Boston Celtics right now, or to you know, you still got to be a professional, you still got to be good and all that. But the storylines write themselves for the, when a team is playing that 2009 finals run like all those stories were written like you just you just react to to greatness and and you can just we get out of the way we just tell the stories when you're not winning or when you're struggling or when you're young or rebuilding you got to dig deep to to find storylines because most likely you're not top five in the league in in any particular category so you really got to dig to find information to show how good the team is or what they're doing in certain areas. And that, that can be challenging. That can be challenging, but it's our job to find those things and to tell the stories about how hard they're working and, and grinding. And that's what makes the wins so rewarding. That's what made those two playoff appearances in the last 12 years. That's what made those so rewarding when you finally got to see that pay off. But it you know, that, that can, that can be challenging to not let the record change your broadcast, right? You, you can't get caught up in, Okay, well, we're struggling as a team, so I'm not going to bring the energy tonight on the broadcast. I mean, every every single game we're zero and zero, right? This is the first broadcast and we're starting over because we, we're undefeated on our broadcast, right? <laughs> At least in our mind, right? So that I think that 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 can be hard. I think for people just starting, you know, to not get caught up in in results and all that, and to to still find what can motivate you, what can find you joy, even if there's not uh, quote unquote team success. Well, I, I do have one more kind of uh, talk and shop question. With the chemistry that you and, you know, Galante have, how is Dante and Galante not a, a weekly thing? You have Magic Drive Time. You have cameras. You have the Advent Center. You have YouTube yeah. channel. How are you not having at least a 5 to 10 to 15-minute segment weekly that you just mm-hmm. like? Like you could have StreamYard, stream it up, get a room at Advent, People would go nuts for it. I, I, I mean, I, I want to put more work on you guys, but you're already talking every day. How is this not happening? Can you bring it back? Can we? Can it be a part of the Close Up Magic podcast? Can it be oh part goodness. of your network? Sure. Can we do Why that? Not? If you, yes, sir. If you, guys, if you, guys, if you guys can make it happen and facilitate it, Dante and Galante will come back. We would love to. Oh my we'd God. love to be involved in some capacity. We have I the link ready for it. you. Link to you guys. We, oh my God. We might not be able to pay you. Like, like what you would expect, but you know, we'll facilitate it. We'll bring it back, no problem. Oh, if you can the bring it back, and you can will get come pouring in. Can you find an interest? Can you find a, a, a viewership? We we will oh, gladly yeah. do it. We will gladly do I mean, it. We'll be happy. Magic dot com. You guys are doing drive time. It's, it's the same interest. Like five to ten minutes of just talking about, hey, what are you doing? What did you hear from Jeff Turner? <laughs> that kind of stuff. I mean, all the inside stories, just for five or ten minutes a week. It, it's brilliant. You know what I'm saying? How about this? How about this? You tell us the time. You, you tell us the time and we're going to start it. We're so going to start. You set it up. Okay. I'll, you set I'll, it up. I'll we're going to we're going to make no the announcement worries. right here, okay? You guys set it up. We'll pick a date and we'll we'll do a couple of week, right? So we'll we'll follow your blueprint and we'll see we'll see where it goes. I mean, so, sounds right. good. I'm going to hold you to that. And we'll we'll make sure that happens. <laughs> maybe uh all right. maybe we'll all kick right. it off in the in the new year. I love um, it. I love it. Dante, let's transition. We I know we have a few minutes left with you, and I wanna I wanna now focus on this current team because it's got its struggles. We're on a six game losing yeah, streak, sure. but you know there's a lot of excitement. You know we have the number one pick. We just got Markel Fultz and Cole Anthony back last night. Um, there's some rust to shake off there. There's some defensive and rebounding identity issues on this team right now, but you know there's also a lot of excitement. So I mean. I guess I'll just start right there. How excited were you 
when you got the news that not only Markel Fultz was coming back, but Cole Anthony and also Terrence Ross, who was kind of likely sure. to come back, but to have three guys that means so much to this team, regardless of the results that we had last night, how, what, what did that initially just make you feel about their impact on the current roster? Well, I think it's huge, man. Have it because you, you got ball handlers. You got guys that can handle the basketball, get you into your offensive sets, right? You've got so now you don't need to have Franz Wagner with the ball in his hands for 30 minutes. You know, he can. I think the first play of the game, you saw Markel with the ball. Franz cut to the basket. Markel found him and you had a dunk. I mean, it was all that. That's the kind of stuff that we're going to start to see more of. And then you see Markel diving on the floor for a loose ball uh, for a team that struggles at times to generate offense. Uh, he can do that. He can get in the paint. He can find shooters. Now you got to knock down shots. That's been a problem uh, for this team, certainly. But the other thing is you got to run. Like when Markell has the ball in his hand, he's going to go. He's looking to get out in transition so we can get easy baskets that way. So if you're not ready to run, uh, you know, he's going to call you out. And, and he's, you know, so he's going to bring you with him. So I think that's another thing that we're going to see. We're going to see a quicker pace and, and all that. And Cole Anthony, you got another ball handler. You got another playmaker. You got another scorer. Uh, you've got another guy that's vocal out there on the floor. So just having guards that can kind of get you into your offense, uh, I, I think is huge. What we saw last night is, guys, we're, we're just struggling without Wendell. You've lost seven of eight games, and it's the seven of eight games that Wendell didn't play. We need that guy out there on the floor. He, he means so much uh, to this team from a rebounding perspective, defensive perspective, which we know, which we knew that when he got hurt, that it'd be tough. But we got to find a way to get him right. Then you can – you can't – the loss was tough last night. I just, for the first time, there just wasn't the effort and focus on the defensive end that that we've needed from start to finish, and that was unfortunate. But you got to rip that up and and move on. But I, I don't think you can truly analyze this team until you have now Wendell back with Markell, with Cole Anthony, with Jalen Suggs. We're close. It feels like it's coming, and these guys are going to return here right around the corner. But once you get all those pieces back and let them play together for a few days, you know, a few games. Now, what do we look like from January 1st on, right? Now, with this with this group intact the rest of the way, are we much better than, than what we've seen the first couple months of the season? I think we will. But I think just having, having two guys that can handle the basketball, get you into your offensive sets, solid defenders, willing defenders, um, just everything makes more sense when Markell and Cole Anthony are out there on the floor. Well, as someone who the last two drafts has said, hey, just take the best shooter, <laughs> saying, yeah, hey, yeah, you, right. you were saying Corey Kisper, you were saying Jabari Smith, you were saying <laughs> right, anybody right. can shoot the rock. Exactly. Uh, <laughs> who, who do you gravitate to this team? Are you looking at Cole? Are you looking at Terrence? Are you looking at Gary Harris? And are you just dying a little inside over these last couple of years where there haven't been the shooters that you want? Is that what you're looking forward to as maybe the trade season comes along, as draft season comes along? Like, get me some shooters in here. Is that how you approach these games or what? You need, you need shooting. You need to have somebody that can knock down shots. And I, I don't know that, you know, if, if you're, you're right now, you're five and 17. If you, you know, if you go another month or two to the trade deadline, you know, and if the record doesn't improve, you're, you're not a buyer, you know, at the trade deadline. Doesn't mean you can't get somebody, but typically, you know, th those top shooters are going to go to teams that are contending, right? So, I, you know, I don't know where you'll be, but you could certainly turn things around. So e either through the draft or through trade, uh, or through free agency, I think you have to get someone in here that can consistently knock down shots. And I'm not saying that these guys on this roster won't do that or can't become that or, or grow into that because you need that too. We need some internal development, but I think at some point you just have to shore, shore that up and you get a guy that comes in that, that you know – everyone's going to have to watch out for and, is, and can get you a basket at any time that they're going to have to double team or, or whatever. But listen, guys, we're, you look at Paulo Bancaro, right? You look at him with what he's able to do. I mean, I, I thought, you know, Jabari Smith, this is a guy, he's that guy. He's going to come in and just knock down shots and how wrong would not, and and Jabari Smith's going to be a great player. No question. But Everything that Paolo brings is exactly what we needed. He's a playmaker. He's a big. He can get to the basket. He gets to the free throw line. He can calm you down. He's a solid defender. He's a great rebounder. So uh, he's been a godsend. I mean, he's been way, way more than we could have ever asked. And Franz Wagner as well. You know, same thing. Great playmaker. Uh, great finisher now with the Euro step and able to, to get into the basket there. So I, I, you have to add a piece, if not two, at some point. And I think, you know, as the way the team is built, you're not going to rush it. We're going to build it right, not fast, right? So kind of, he's kind, we're kind of going to observe and see what the team tells you, and then you kind of add pieces and go from there. But whatever piece you add, if he's a knockdown shooter, I'm, I'm okay with that. 
<laughs> it's it's fun that you you know just naturally brought up Franz and Paulo because that's where I was wanting to head next. It's you know obviously we need shooting and we love all these players on this team, but it's going to get shaken up whether it's at this deadline or next summer. We're going to see just naturally with contracts coming up and you know certain players not in the rotation as much even when when they are needed. It's we're going to see some new faces eventually on this team, but. What we do know is Paulo and Franz are part of this future. Um, and, and with the modern NBA being about, you know, shooting from space and also having these wings that can handle and play make, it's like we we hit the bullseye on the head with these two. You know, you have two 6'10 forwards that can yeah. handle the ball like a guard, that can pass like a guard, that have some size, can play a little bit in the paint with some of the centers and bigger guys. Um, long term, you know, when you look at your Celtics, um, you, you look at Milwaukee, um, the Raptors, all these teams that have had recent success, not necessarily always leading to a championship, but very good playoff runs. Um, some of sure. them have led to championships. What does that get you excited? Like, what are you what are you feeling and thinking long term team building wise oh, yeah. when you see your two center blocks as Paulo and Franz, uh, and now that we have some proof of them playing together and what that could look like? Just what are your thoughts around those two and whole as just like okay, there are two building blocks. Let's go. Yeah, no, I th- I think and that's the challenge, right? Because okay, last night was frustrating as heck, right? I I I get high and excited and all that with, uh, you know, with, with wins and losses like fans do, right? We sit there, we put all this work into a broadcast. You want to see the perfect game. It pays off and you get the win. You get to interview someone at the end. Great. And all that, but you got to think long picture and you got, you got to think long term and big picture and you got to, you got to look at it and you got to think, have, have we, have we found a couple pieces? And I think we certainly have. And I, you know, you mentioned Milwaukee, you mentioned Boston, you mentioned Toronto, right? Those teams. Those teams would all give anything to have a guy like Wendell Carter Jr. So to me, that's another piece. I think that's another piece that that you certainly have identified. And you've got him and you just gave him a contract. And I think that's a guy that you can win with. Well, look what we, we've seen what's happened without him. So now you're you're analyzing everything else. You know, Markel able to stay healthy on the floor. I think that's a piece. I think absolutely you can build on that. Cole Anthony, is he a two, is he a six man? You know, is he coming off the bench? Is Jalen Suggs is the fifth overall pick for a reason? You know, this guy's shown flashes of brilliance as bowl well. Bowl. So I think the bowl, bowl. All of these guys have shown they can be pieces uh, moving forward. But you're right. At some point, do you decide, okay, we, we have a, you know, some, you know, it could be a contract situation or we have an opportunity to package some guys together and, and get someone in here who's an all star already or, or a proven commodity. You know, those are decisions that'll be made at a higher level and they have to decide all that certainly as we go. But I think that's the other part of this draft capital that we have, right? So you've got the Chicago Bulls first round pick and you've got your first round pick. You're already the fourth youngest team in the NBA. Do you have to get younger? Do we need two more lottery picks? Or is that now trade capital? Is that now leverage that you have, you know, to be able to move up in the draft and get one player or move back or or trade for a player or a commodity, right? So I think you've in, in your your salary cap is so low. I think the way this thing has been designed, you have so much flexibility. You can go a number of directions. You can go through the draft if you want to continue doing that way. You're in a position you can trade because you've got a ton of assets. Uh, or now maybe you've shown enough young guys. And, you know, we saw Kevin Durant show his affinity for Paolo Bancaro the other night. So could there be an, an upcoming free agent that wants to play with Paolo? You know, that's the beauty of this, right? So you've now made yourself – uh, a viable option and a number of different routes, just whichever way you decide to go. But I do think, to your point, the rest of this year is going to be about finalizing and determining exactly who your pieces are moving forward and then and then trying to fill up the rest of the roster this summer. Yeah, I, I don't want to get you in trouble, obviously, tampering-wise and all, but I, I want to take the two picks and I want to throw the Brinks truck for Fred Van Vliet in restricted free agency next year. I think he's a perfect fit as a shooter, a scorer, that kind of uh, bulldog defender at, at the point guard position, and you just kind of go from there. And who else wants to come? But um, me and Stephen are at odds as to what to do with you know that second pick next year. Stephen is much more like, hey, hey, anybody want this? Anybody want this? I, it's an opportunity. Whereas I'm like, I really don't want to give it up, but I, I can definitely see where my man's coming from. So it's an interesting conversation. 
But isn't that a good spot to be in, right? As totally. opposed to not having – look with the Lakers, right? That's what everybody talks about. They don't have any draft cap. Now you've got Anthony Davis and LeBron James. That's two pretty good options uh, to have. But you don't have any – you don't have any draft capital moving forward, right? And you don't have – you don't have, you know, salary cap flexibility, right? You don't have all those options. This team does. So I, I think you've got, you can go a number of directions and maybe somebody, you know, maybe one of these teams at the top or thought they were going to be at the top of the East or West decides to blow it up. And now all of a sudden guys are available and there's nobody more in, in a better position to take on salary or players or whatever than this franchise right here. So you've made yourself a, a, a player deciding whatever route you decide to go. I'll, I'll do one more question. We'll let Malik get one more and then we'll wrap it up. Cause I know we're just a little over 30 minutes, if that's okay with you. Um, oh, you're good. Yeah. Yeah. No problem. When, when you look at all the possibilities with this team, right? You, you, you do have draft capital. You do have cap space. Um, you do have some young players, uh, some tradable contracts, I mean, just as a broadcaster, doesn't that make you pretty excited? Like what this oh, team yeah. could look like in two years, you know, like with with that. But with all that being said, the the, the question is, this this front office. I, I get is- less ex- I get less excited as a broadcaster about cap flexibility than I do about actual sure. players. I, that makes <laughs> sense. And but I get but that you're right. But sure. no. But I do know. I know exactly what you mean. I'm but I, I guess my my overall question is, this front office they have a. I will say unique way of communicating um, that can be uh, well-received and also extremely frustrating uh, as a fan, particularly when it comes to injury communication. Um, as a broadcaster, do you find the communication of the the front office of this front office a little bit more? I'm not going to say, I mean, they're your bosses. So like, I'm not trying to like have you throw them under the bus, but What's the difference of working for someone like this front office who's a little bit more tight-lipped and very specific with the information they release compared to a past front office that you've worked with or a head coach where they're a little bit more open with what they're allowed to say or just just a little bit less uh, specific with how they want to present things? Well, I don't think it's so much uh, regimes as it is this is the time we're in now. This is the time we're in now where, val- where information is so valuable you know, Jeff and John have been doing this for quite some time. And I think if you go back 10 or 15 years, I don't I don't think you needed to have all the secrecy that you do now. So I think probably even they were different and handled things different uh, than they do now. But I think there's such a there's such a premium. You know, you're trying to build trust with agents and, you know, with uh, with players and this and that. And, you know, look at going up to the draft. Everyone thought for sure it was a lock. You know, the, the Vegas odds had Jabari Smith going as the number one pick until a couple hours before the draft. Then, it, you know, somebody caught wind. What, we got the Woj bomb, right, that it's going to be Paolo. I mean, that, that surprised all of us, you know. So we're not getting any information inside uh, that, you know, it, it, that anyone else is getting, you know. So I think that's that, that's by design. And I, I, I typically think that's kind of the way the league is going. I mean, you don't really find anybody divulging a ton of information because I, I don't – and I think, and I get the reason that you know it's it's not it's not entirely fair to a player if you say this guy's going to be back in a week. Well, and in a week's time, he's still feeling pain and doesn't come back. Well, now there's a perception that well, this guy doesn't play through pain, or this guy, you know, this guy's taking his time, or maybe the injury's worse than we thought. So I think that's that's where you can get in trouble with speculating, um, you know, or you can go the hockey route where they just say it's an upper body injury or lower body injury, and we don't know when they'll be back. I mean, there's there's no divulging of information in other sports. Uh, but I get it. I, I, you know, as a fan, you want to know what's going on. You want to know what I want. I want to know the exact day Jonathan Isaac's coming back, just like everybody else. You know, I think everybody wants to know that. But I, I, I do think, obviously, there's a timeline. Obviously, you're, you're targeting for somebody to be back from an injury by this time. Do we need to know that? I don't know that we do, right? So we just, we, we when the person gets there, we just report on it. Does it make it less frustrating as a fan to not know the exact day? Sure. Uh, but I think there's, there's reasons for it. And I, I, I just think at the end of the day, you have to respect the player, the front office, the agents, the family, all the things that are at play. And, you know, we just, we just hope that they're back sooner rather than later. It's not a good answer yeah, always, me, you know, it's, it's not awesome, a good man. answer, but, <laughs> but I think that's where, I just think that's where it's going in professional sports. I think you're, there's so much money tied up into it. There's so much about relationships that you, you're just, you're just trying <laughs> desperately to make sure you protect 
okay. all of your entities. And, you know, that's one way to do it. Not not putting a timetable out there for somebody. Sorry. Can you guys hear me now, or is it my back? Yep. I You're apologize. Good. <laughs> my, 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 my last question is that um, you seem to kind of come from the head of Zeus fully formed to my vision. So I watched the magic back in the day with, you know, uh, Greg Kite and all those guys. And then suddenly yeah. once the magic got good, you were suddenly back. And now I want you to be with the magic from now on. Do you have aspirations to go elsewhere or are you going to be a lifer with the magic? Well, thank you, man. I appreciate that. My goal is to be here. My goal is to be here. And I've had opportunities and I've looked at other things and I just, my family's, uh, you know, my, my wife is from here, right? She grew up here and we're in the town that she grew up in. Um, we love it here. We, we just fell in love with this community, with this area, um, obviously with the sunshine and, and everything that comes with Central Florida as well. But the people here and this organization, uh, you look around the entire organization, we have 200 plus employees and I, I would say half of them have been here five years or more, right? And then you look at, you know, another half of those have been here 10 years or more. I mean, people get in this organization and they don't leave, right? You believe in what's what's happening. You believe in the ownership here. You love this community. So I would love to see it through. You know, one day when David Steele decides to retire, I'd, I would love it if they came and said, hey, you know, we want you to be next. So, so that would be the goal. I would love that. Certainly love that opportunity. I love filling in for him. Uh, when, when he wasn't able to do it. So, you know, that that would be pie in the sky, something that I never thought would be possible. Uh, but now, don't get me wrong, I hope David does this for another 30 years. I love the guy, and I, I don't think there's anyone better. You know, and I don't know what my day would be like without is this anything, to be quite honest with you. So I love uh, – I so, yeah, but, I, but you know, long story short, I mean, if someone blew me away and said, hey, we need you to come here and do this, and we'd certainly have to look at it. But we've thought about it. We've looked at different things, and – it's just never made sense to leave Central Florida, and, and no, I'm hoping that the and it's very it's very uncommon. People don't stay with one team this long, um, so I, I, I'm kind of proud of that. The fact that I, I've kind of been able to to stay here and see this thing come up. You know, I've been here for 25 of the 34 years of this organization. You know, and that's a lot of fun. And now I'm like motivated to stick it out to see them win a championship. I want to be I want to be I want to see a parade here in Central Florida. I don't nice. want to leave. I don't want to leave before it's done, and, I, and I'm hoping we're on the path for that right now. Yeah, it's going to feel nice. I feel, you know, I obviously don't work for the Magic, but I've been following the team since, you know, early, early 2000s. You know, I moved to Central Florida in the late 90s, and uh, it's – it's yeah, there's, a, there's a community there. There's definitely a, fan, uh, a group of diehard fans um, such as myself and Malik. Yes. And, you know, I'm not there, but you can tell there's a different energy this season with fandom. Um, right. You know, in the arena, around the team, a different type of excitement we haven't had in a few years, and a lot of that is thanks to the success. Stephen, how do you how do you friends. explain that? Be because I'm so enamored. I mean, th this team has had its struggles up and down, but this fan base has been absolutely phenomenal and so loyal and and so encouraging. Well, where where does I I just I'm so blown away and appreciative of that. I really am. It, it's unbelievable. Well, I would say the the quick explanation is you have people with unhealthy addictions like myself who just love <laughs> and and, okay, and Malik that just love the ups and downs of teams and team building and just you know like that aspect. The last twelve years have been tough, but I think everyone loves a good underdog story and wants sure. to see an yeah. underdog grow. And you know, I don't know now, but all of a sudden, like young players this team is more exciting than it's ever been no no disrespect to the last group of guys sure. but it's just a different ceiling that we have and when i get texts from friends who have not paid attention to magic to all of a sudden saying tell me about paulo i've been watching this yeah you know, i've been watching yeah. a couple of games recently um you know or hey i i lost i have a friend who decided to not be a fan ever since he th we traded his favorite player vince carter and um you know all of a sudden he's watching games again you know you're doing something right um, when I'm watching games on TV and you're seeing the stadium and arenas look more full and you're hearing more I'm crowd noise coming over the broadcast, right. it's just, I don't know what it is, but this team is doing something right. Um, I think not only team building wise, but I think the way this front office has started to, to hire the right people to do better on social media, to, to get yeah. content out there to people and, and integrate right. with the community. I think that's just another, um, you know, another solid move that this front office has made. So I don't know if I've answered your question, well, but like outside looking in, well, that's my perspective of it. 
Well, I, I'd also say that I, I think it's also when you're when you're in a troubled relationship with someone you're in love with, and you've been through <laughs> tough times together. Yes, yes, uh, good, good. There comes a point where you're like, I don't want this to be how the story ends. I know things are rough now. Maybe we don't feel the same way we, we felt in the yes. past, but I'm going to make sure this has a freaking happy ending. This ain't how my story ends. My story know, doesn't end exactly. with I went through hell, and then we went to hell and lived in hell. Nah, man. We went through hell, that's and then right. we came out the right. other side because then we had that story. So I think we're kind of in Malik is the in, consummate in philosophizer. I like it. You are you <laughs> are some... like Socrates over there. He's he's dropped the head of Zeus. He's dropped the relationships. I mean, that's impressive. He's got I mean, a lot that's... of really good analogies for sure. It's fun. <laughs> it's fun. But you're right. But I think but I think we're all in that together. I I think and we've become stronger as a community going through some of these ups and downs. But I think we all have the same goal. We want to see it. We want to see it succeed. We want to see this thing through. Yeah. And, you know, the first thing I thought of when I'm standing in Boston and we're going back to the playoffs uh, for the first time in eight years or whatever it was, six years, was, you know, obviously Vooch and Evan with what they've been through, but it's the fans. You know, I think about the fans. I think about when DJ Augustine hit that game winner in Toronto in game one and that explosion down on Orange Ave, you know, down on Wall Street, yeah. that little plaza. I think about, I mean, this community is so great. And they're ready to explode and erupt and embrace this team once they get back there. And it's you're right to see the building and the energy in the building uh, has been fantastic. Now a lot of that energy is because of Bull Bull, and it should be because I, sure. I just find my I, I don't I watch the whole game and I don't take my eyes off him. I, everything he does is 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 absolutely mind blowing in my opinion. Well, but well, but fans are fans Bowl are there and, and it's a great atmosphere. That's right. Bull That's and right. Bull is such a charismatic duo, you know. So. Yes, it is. And you guys got to workshop a nickname. If you guys can come up, I'll tell you right now, you know, we got the human torch going there on the broadcast, but you come up with a, with a working nickname for Bull Bull, it's going to be huge. I, uh, Jake Chapman, who does our radio broadcast throughout the, saw Bull Bull block the shot and he called him the magic eraser. And I said, oh my gosh, now that is good. That is good. But if you guys can workshop a nickname, I, I think you'd I think you'd be on to something. Well, there. We I've, gotta I've get the trying, nickname. I've come to work on, on, on the LOL Bowl, but hasn't gone over the way I ho hoped it would. So Okay. We, yep. <laughs> well, the thing with nicknames though is we gotta get the player to like the nickname and embrace it. That's totally. the whole thing, you know? Yes. Um I, one last moment, uh, and then we'll we'll let you go is I do think that part of the community and team success is also a part of, of uh, the connection that the broadcasters give with us. Right. Um, you know, David Steele pulling questions for, is this anything from people on yes. Twitter? Uh, yes. You guys jumping on podcasts like this. I mean, Dante, you and I have talked about doing a podcast together for a few years now and scheduling wise, we just didn't make it work until today, which is you know great and fine. But like, you know, 2019, you know, you and I are in each other's, uh, messaging each other and we we meet up on a road game at the Kings at halftime just to say hi to each other um, you know and and it's you do that with a lot of fans not just me and I think that goes a long way too there's a connection that we see you guys as broadcasters making with the fans um, that you might not get with other teams and I think that just like helps fans stay connected to this team oh, um, I appreciate that. in the last couple of years have been really tough i mean there's there's no lie you know the last decade's been tough so sure, um, sure. i think a lot of the credit also goes to you to helping trans translate the energy that is from the team to the people that are not there in the building so um with all that well, being, i appreciate that i appreciate that Stephen, and i and i think that's part of that's part of our Part of our responsibility as broadcasters is to bring the players, is to make that connection between yeah. the players and the fans, right? But I think it's all, you know, that's the nature of David Steele, Jeff Turner, myself, Brian Hill, is we just enjoy the heck out of it. And we enjoy every interaction we have with with all fans and, and with all broadcasters, everybody surrounding the team. I mean, it's, it's ridiculous to, for all of us to get to do this. And if there wasn't the Orlando Magic, the three of us would never have met, right? Like, how do we totally. make this connection, right? So I, I love that. I get a kick out of that. And, Technology still blows my mind. We're doing this. We're looking at each other in California, Gainesville, Orlando. I mean, it's it's absolutely fantastic. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. It's it's been great. And uh, you know, the on on Twitter, there's a thing, you know, Magic Fam, and it's it's true. It's true. So, with all that being said, Dante, I just want to first appreciate you for taking. We said that we were going to go 30 minutes. We've now gone almost 50. We appreciate you giving us so no much problem. of your time today. Um, hopefully we can get you on the show again some point in the future. Uh, I'm excited for this team to get a little bit more healthy and, and, and 
and just so we can get some more wins and excitement. And even if the wins don't come, just to see a little bit more of the bigger picture come together, right. um, you know, as this team continues to develop and, and show what its true characters are. But uh, thank you for coming on the show. Uh, Malik, thank you for making this happen during your work day too and the start of mine. And I'm glad we could make this work. And um, for all you Magic fans listening, Make sure you let Dante know that you appreciate him. Make sure you guys let, you know, look out for the future Dante and Galante show coming on the Close Up Magic uh, YouTube channel, which will happen. And uh, we appreciate you. Be ready. You. Just let us know. Let us know where to be. We'll be, we'll we'll be do. ready. I, I have your information, so I will be following up. Okay. So, All right. Guys, this thanks. is a pleasure. This, this is what makes it so fun for me is, is to get to chat and, and kind of, you know, kind of and, and pick your brain too and find out what, you know, what fans are talking about and what makes this so fun. So I, I appreciate it. Keep up the great work that you guys do. Uh, it, it's unbelievable the, the following and, and, and how, and the passion uh, that you guys show. So don't lose that. Don't lose that. Keep that going and keep, Keep Magic fans informed. So keep up the great work, and I'm available anytime. So so let me know. We'll talk to you yes, soon. Yes, sir. We appreciate you. And uh, to all the listeners and viewers, let's go Magic. See you next week.